My name is Father Leo Moss. It had already been one of the more difficult days of my life when the accident happened. I was driving home at about one in the morning from a bar, a bar where I would not have been save for my distress over a conversation I'd had six hours earlier. Bishop Kane had called me over to Rossi Street unexpectedly for a talk. She courteously and carefully laid out my options for transfer to a parish in either Missoula or Denver. She plied me with many compliments and thanks for my work in Boise, but she explained that the distraction, the murmur, unfortunately caused by the investigation into my alleged inappropriate financial conduct with a member of my congregation, had been judged great enough by the right Reverend Thomas to warrant a sort of disinfection of the situation, as the bishop put it. I believe in you, she said and shook my hand firmly, and gave me some papers to take home and examine. And I thought, with some measure of guilt, if you believe in me, then the facts should make a difference. But the facts had not and would not make a difference. I saw that clearly. No one was willing to look deep enough or ask questions uncomfortable enough to bring to light everything that should have been. And so, after signing those papers alone in the vicarage, I slunk off to a bar called Reggie's Roost at on Route 21 south of the city, and I stewed in my anger. Just two beers for me, mind you. I sat alone near the empty karaoke platform and tried to look at it all through the lens of a test. Yes, one more test in a life of them. And I would pass this one the same way I had passed the others, with my love of God to arm me. That love which, for me, is the single truth that can't be corrupted by rough seas or redefined according to changing times and attitudes. Since I was an adolescent made almost dizzy sometimes by the infinite possibilities of that truth, I had followed it steadfast. But on that one night, I allowed myself to simply hate a little. To distract myself from my situation, I played darts with the foreman of a furniture warehouse, and I got into a discussion about movie musicals with two elderly women who marveled that someone so young even knew who Gene Kelly was. When I left the bar to drive the 16 miles home, I was sober and rational, just a little worried about the flurries that were falling. It happened near Lucky Peak where 21 starts to twist and turn all the way northeast to Stanley. I stopped briefly at one of 21's very few blinking red lights and took the opportunity to wave the car behind me around. It had been tailgating me for the past three miles, and I was thoroughly fed up. After a pause, it began to maneuver to the left of me. Instead of using the shoulder to squeak by, the driver used the oncoming lane. As soon as that car started to pull past me, something huge came out of the dark into the glare of my headlights. I heard it tear the underbrush before I saw it, an animal body moving at great speed out of the woods to my right. Never in my life had a thing that size rushed toward me like that. And though I was safe in the car, I cried aloud, twisting the wheel to the left and putting enough pressure on the gas to lurch forward in evasion. The animal was a fully mature elk, head low. In an instant, it made a mockery of all the tepid two-dimensional videos I'd seen of them in the wild, its enormity and power driving mute terror into me. I heard its hooves clack on the pavement and saw its eyes glittering in the high beams, and then there was a soft scraping sound as my car connected with the one beside me, which had slammed on its brakes and never cleared me. The elk grazed its front bumper just enough to set the car, a tan Mercedes, rocking gently. The panicked beast galloped into the woods on the other side of the road, plowing into the brush. Its antlers must have risen four feet off its head. One bare instant of its unfiltered size and power making a physical threat, and then gone. I had finally encountered the reality of the wild on whose domesticated edges I had lived for three years.
Realizing I had scraped the Mercedes in my panic, I couldn't stop myself from releasing a burst of profanity. I took a moment to collect myself, then shut off my engine and stepped out onto the cold, silent road. The other car rested beside and just a few feet ahead of mine. It bore clear marks on the passenger side door where I dinged it, meaning an inevitable and expensive repair job. The driver already had his window rolled down. It was a man in his late thirties, maybe. Dark red hair, clean-shaven and professional-looking. He didn't move as I approached him. I asked him if he was all right, and he gave me only a distracted half-nod. I craned my head to check out his front bumper, which seemed unmarked and secure. When I gave him this piece of silver lining, I again received only the slightest positive acknowledgement. He looked like a man trying to work through a complex geometry problem in his head, refusing to let me or anything else distract him. I told him I suppose we should exchange insurance information and turned to head back to my car to get it. The quicker the better. Though the flurries had stopped, I was getting uncomfortably cold. In response to my statement, he finally turned his head to me and made apathetic eye contact. Though he was well-dressed in a casual way, he looked pallid and weary. I have no interest in that, he told me quietly. I had to have him repeat that odd sentence. So he did, with the exact same tone and inflection. A lifeless carbon copy. I said I believed it was the law, but this seemed to go right through him. His eyes drifted to my clerical collar. I was still wearing it under my old jacket with the Neshota House Seminary logo on it. He asked me if I was a priest, but then had no verbal follow-up to my affirmative reply. Nothing. Only silence. Finally, he opened the driver's side door and stepped out onto the road. He didn't immediately examine the damage to his car as I expected, though. Didn't look at it at all, in fact. Instead, he first took in the horizon over the mountains, walking a little ways toward them, and then he stared down at the road mournfully. The blinking red light over our heads could be heard clicking when it went on and off every few seconds. It was not even a proper intersection, only a place where vehicles could turn left toward an industrial access path whose gate was now locked tight. At this hour... The enforced stop seemed infuriatingly without purpose, except maybe to calm speeders on this long stretch that invited raucous driving. The man asked me where we were, and I told him. It came to me for the first time that he might be drunk, but his steps were perfectly steady on the pavement. His Mercedes had Wyoming plates, Rather than pursue his history, I merely suggested we could be on our way and out of the cold if we just swapped our info now. He asked me, Why did you feel the need to turn the wheel and lurch like that? I was taken aback. I told him it was just instinct. You thought you could create that much space, he said. Not angrily, no, but... I saw a disturbing amount of hostility in his expression. This was a man interested in picking a fight. So I softened my own tone even more, offering that yes, I guessed there wasn't much point in hindsight, but this would not suffice for him. I'm not hearing an apology, he said. The left half of his face became bathed in red light under that alternating electric current. And it went dark again, over and over. This was it, I realized. This was road rage. The quiet kind, maybe. But still worrisome. Chilling. This was encountering the wrong man at the wrong time. I stammered something about how the elk had come out of nowhere. I hadn't had time to process. It looked enormous. I did what had simply come to me. Even in the middle of these feeble sentences, I felt my own mood turning darker. I was getting angry at this provocation. So, in your mind, said the man, 
squeezing his eyes shut as if my ineptitude was giving him a headache. You did nothing wrong. A pickup truck approached our spot from the direction we'd both come, moving at a troublingly high speed and just barely slowing. It blew right through the light and kept going. Maybe we didn't look terribly distressed, this man and I, almost like two guys conferring about directions. Still, the callousness of the person in that truck was distressing. It sped away without a care. I made my final plea to the man that this was all a matter for the insurance people to suss out, hoping he would finally let me go. He asked me again if I was a priest and where. I told him. Again, he seemed not to know just what to do with this information. He mused upon it. He'd been getting steadily closer. Then he caused me a panicked moment when he took a long, sudden step towards me. But he was only trying to get past me to finally examine the accident damage. He crouched before the door. There was a single long smear of maroon paint from my Camry below his door handle. He laid the tip of his index finger with strange gentleness on the smear, tracing its entire length. I was doing my best to collect myself and remind myself of who I had always tried to be. I asked him where he was going. He emerged from his reverie and straightened again. Just away, he said. My wife has changed. She needs help, but nothing works. My wife has changed. Not my wife is sick or my wife left me. He could have meant anything. Shivering a little, I made what I thought was a delicate and tactful inquiry as to the nature of the help he was looking for, but he cut me off mid-sentence. Doesn't this just sum it up, he said. Not even a priest will listen to facts. As I stared at him, mute with confusion, he added that this seemed like the perfect night for our paths to cross, because now... With just a few sentences between us, he could cross everyone off the list. Absolutely everyone. Whatever positive will I had been trying to summon was leaving me. I couldn't help it. I was getting genuinely mad. I inquired reluctantly as to what facts he was talking about. He explained to me, with the tone of someone speaking to a child, that the insurance company was definitely going to side with me because he had moved into the oncoming lane, even though I had waved him around. That was the incontrovertible truth, as they would see it. I waved you around, I said, because you were tailgating me. So, in your version, he replied, I intimidated you. Is that right? I put myself in that place. He was moving closer to me again. It was about that moment when I stopped being Father Leo, and it was nothing more than Leo Moss, who'd once been suspended from high school for coming up behind my 11th grade bully and knocking him to the floor of the hallway outside the library with one hard punch to the spine. I began to explain to this man that if he had followed at the right distance what the guidelines generally were, I would not have waved him around. And besides, he should have used the shoulder anyway for safety, because, as he seemed to agree, the road bent, and the curve ahead was almost blind. He took real exception to this last bit, noting how unusually bright the sky was that night, with visibility ahead actually being quite good, considering the hour. Quite good. Of course, headlights actually made that a moot point, but still, he wanted to challenge my loose choice of words. Blind curve. Blind curve curve. Another example of me not dealing in fact. The fact is, he said, your turn, your little gambit, was random and unwarranted. He was just three feet away from me now, one hand pressed to the hood of his car. Though I found myself wanting to win this somehow, wanting to cut him with just the right word or a bit of infallible logic, I backed down. You need to learn to control your impulses, 
Mr. Andewall had lectured me after my suspension, and I have never forgotten either the cruelty or the essential wisdom of that phrase. I pulled my wallet out, and from it I took, with a shaky hand, one of my contact cards. I took my own step forward and pressed it firmly on the hood of the Mercedes and backed away, pronouncing the argument pointless because of the existence of accident reports. He was welcome to claim whatever he liked. If he wasn't quick in picking that card up, the breeze was going to blow it away. Yet he didn't. He barely glanced at it. And sure enough, it tumbled onto the road. The man reiterated to me that he was done with all of this. Though what this meant remained unclear. This was the end of the road for him. There was a hollowness and stoniness to the statement that frightened me. He told me that when he had seen my collar, he'd thought, maybe, just maybe, it was a sign. He wasn't looking for salvation or anything. He only thought I might listen to the facts that others had dismissed. But he said he was clearly wrong. That was when things turned just a little again. Eleven years in the priesthood had begun to educate me about what someone sounded like when they were clinging to their very last thread. Most people don't know how to honestly express that, so it gets cloaked in hostility, accusation, circular reasoning. I asked him to please tell me what it was that was disturbing him, what it was exactly that was troubling him. What about his wife? And I know I suddenly sounded like some movie priest, but it was what it was. We both heard a low, muffled scraping sound from nearby, quite close, very quick. The man turned his head idly toward it. Its origin wasn't clear. It could have been some unseen small animal crossing paths with stray broken glass on the pavement, or even a mechanical component settling awkwardly inside the man's engine or mine because of the cold. My contact card skittered a little further away on the pavement, flopping face down. By morning, it too would be deep in the woods. Thirteen months now of doctors and lunatics on the internet, said the man. He informed me he'd bought a gun the week before, and had held it dozens of times at home before finally getting in the car and starting to just drive for days in an attempt to escape its possibilities. But you know, he said with a weird, pained smile, my anger seems to be going more outward now. To demonstrate, he thrust his arms out in my direction in one clean snap, as if pushing something away, and he laughed at this odd image he had created, the most cynical laugh one can imagine. I made one last attempt to get him to back up and explain it all to me so it made sense, but he would not let go of the belief that it was me who was keeping us from dealing in facts. The truth is, he said, this was your Tell me it was your fault. Tell me that so I know it's in your heart. And then I can talk to you. Something bad was going to happen physically, I thought, if I didn't fold with some very convincing play acting right then. A physical altercation was ground I was terrified to trot. So I did fold, acknowledging with a slight stammer that maybe he was right. I wasn't that great a driver. I didn't have much experience with sudden events on the road. He knew how it was, right? You, you developed this muscle memory. No, no, he interrupted. That gets us farther away. I've been placated until my head explodes. It's got to come from your heart. Don't you understand? His eyes were getting wide. He wasn't drunk. He was, I believe, going mad. Whatever it was, I thought it was something outside of himself, some unstoppable force bringing him fear and stress and locked doors with no way out but I had to self-preserve that above all things. I'd come close to being the victim to madness once before. Almost every priest or counselor or first responder has had that very rare brush. I'd been told by an elder that the sad but critical strategy was to say anything that would maneuver you past it to safety. I apologized gently in a softer voice for whatever he was going through and for any way I might have made it worse. I gave him my full name and again the name of the parish and told him I could be contacted there, either about the accident or anything else. 
I backed away a little faster than was polite and went around my car's front end toward the door, breathing hard. I opened it and got in, hoping the abrupt finality of my movement would leave him with no way to extend the scene. And it seemed like it had worked. He moved toward his door, too, opened it, got in. He stared through his windshield blankly as I started my engine. This seemed to cue him to start his, too. We were moving on. It was over. Let it get ugly later from a distance. That was just fine. There'd be plenty of room and time to chastise myself over my weakness, my heartlessness, later at home. Now, though, just as I was twisting the wheel away from his car and putting mine into drive, he hit a button and his passenger side window was rolling down. He tilted his chin upward in a gesture suggesting he had something more for me to hear. God help me. I rolled my window down in response, feeling overly safe, one foot hesitating on the brake, knowing I could be out of there in a heartbeat if need be. Tell me one thing, he called to me across the narrow distance between our cars. What is your definition of tailgating? I said, what? He lifted a hand to the ceiling of the car and cued his dome light. A weak white glow fell upon his haggard face. Let's see if we can agree on this one thing, he said. But no, I told him we had talked this out long enough. Define it, he said insistently, and added that if we could achieve this one common point of fact, he would tell me everything. And whether what overcame me was the residual anger over my unjust transfer out of my parish, or simply the sense that he had tricked me and had never intended to quite let me go. I almost openly sneered at this poor man, fueled by an immature need to take a controlled but icy parting shot. You were following close enough to make me uncomfortable, I said. It was dangerous, You didn't think it was dangerous, he replied quickly. That's what everyone claims. You were just irritated. Admit it. I said nothing. I have no common point with anyone anymore, he told me finally. And then he smiled once again. See how you like this, you liar, he said. And his left hand, which had dropped from the dome light out of sight on his left side, emerged again as I heard the sound of his trunk unlatching and popping open. It lifted smoothly on its hinges with a kind of neat engineering efficiency I'd never be able to afford. I craned my head to look, alarmed. Something large began to crawl out of the trunk, some bulky, dark mass eager to emerge. As it did so, the man stepped hard on the gas, and the Mercedes leapt forward, causing the living cargo to tumble out all at once onto the road. The tires left long streaks in the pavement as the car revved away, headlights remaining off. The red glare of the taillights lit the thing on the pavement only for an instant. I saw a dark body with long, hairy arms and short legs and a head much too large for its shoulders. It pushed itself up from its awkward landing and tried to stand fully erect, but the construction of its body was so crude and disjointed that it could achieve only a hunched, precarious balance. It came right for me in frantic pursuit, half hopping, half shambling toward my window. I hit the gas pedal, but my wheel remained turned dramatically to the right, and my car sprang almost directly at the shoulder. I hit the brakes before I lost control entirely, and then the shambling thing was on me. It slammed into the side of the car clumsily, and its head protruded through the window, which had remained rolled up only halfway after my final exchange with the disturbed stranger. A dripping canine mouth spewing hot breath was opening and closing like a machine inches away from my face. I felt a wet, furry snout brush my cheek and angry snarls washed over me. The creature was furious to be thwarted by the pane of glass keeping it from full entry. Two big, misshapen eyes showed nothing but white like protruding bulbs of garlic. It was the arms that destroyed any notion that this was fully a wolf indigenous to the area. They were long and 
angular, and one bloated paw was able to grasp the base of the wipers as they hit the gas again to try to shake the beast off. The long, hairy fingers protruding from the other paw clamped over my window glass. The head shook back and forth crazily as it fought for every inch of penetration into the vehicle. I had to beat the animal off with both hands to survive the attack, desperately grabbing at the wheel only in strobe bursts of attempted control. The car wove almost randomly. Contrary to what seemed possible, the animal was managing to push itself further in, its stumpy legs only touching the pavement when it was possible to gain leverage. Its jaws snapped, missing my throat by an inch, and I slammed hard on the brakes one last time before we drove off the road into the trees. I ducked while thrusting my left hand outwards into my attacker's snout twice, but I was only risking the loss of my fingers. In the scuffle, my entire hand arced directly through that canine mouth and came out slick. I lunged for the passenger side door, grabbing the handle with my right hand and hauling myself toward it. The car was drifting ever forward, so the beast had to struggle with its balance, barely keeping it from full propulsion into the car. I scrambled into a prone position on my back and kicked at it. Its shoulders were fully inside now. The animal's head ripped the fabric on the underside of the roof as it came. Its teeth got hold of one of my shoes and it yanked its head left and right in a blunder blur of motion, its dumb white eyes gazing at I don't know what. I pulled my foot back hard and lost the shoe to its mad thrashings. It struck the steering wheel and fell out of sight. I realized as I got the door open that my attacker had become wedged hard in the window gap, so eager to rip me apart that it had lost its sense of space entirely and could manage neither to get any further into the car or pull itself out. That was what saved me. I pushed myself out the door and went shoulder first onto the road, the car slowly moving on. Its collision course with the trees was inevitable, though it was going to happen in slow motion. I saw the beast's body hanging out the window, temporarily stuck. The legs were so underdeveloped compared to those deviant arms that the awkward locomotion I'd seen it struggle with made perfect sense. I heard it panting and start to emit uncanny shrieks as it panicked against its self-made trap. I shrugged off the stab of pain in my shoulder where I'd connected with the pavement, got to my feet, and started running for the opposite side of the road. I only heard the thump as the Camry made rough contact with the shallow ditch and continued just a few yards till it hit a thin tree. Just beyond the strip of wild grass that lined Route 21 on my right, the woods began, and I plunged into them, instinctively going towards concealment rather than taking my chances on the open road, where even if someone came along quickly, the sight of a running man waving for help might just as well send them past me faster. I'd been dimly aware that the land sloped downward from the highway, and somehow this made me think I could move fast. The bareness of the trees and the unexpected brightness of the sky gave me good visibility as I ran, weaving, leaves crunching below me. Just half a minute in, already winded, I found that the slope was more pronounced than I had thought, and I began to feel the weight of my body creating a dangerous momentum, panic obliterating the good sense to slow down. The terrain kept arcing more and more dramatically. I reached out with my right arm to begin to use fleeting touches of the skinny trees all around me to regain some control, but then I heard a volley of barking rise far behind me. The beast was coming. The trees broke cleanly up ahead of me, but finally the slope won. All it took was hitting a patch where the leaves had bunched up enough to deny me any traction at all. Having become too top-heavy, I felt myself start to tumble sideways, and I went down on my ribs on my left side. A great gout of dry air erupted from my chest as I was thrown into an uncontrolled roll that mercifully steered clear of the remaining trees. I saw a dark kaleidoscope of fractured images of my surroundings, swirls of dark wood and sky with the silvery coin of the moon ricocheting through them. Then, as if God himself had dragged me upward by the back of the neck, my momentum pushed me uncertainly back onto my feet and still facing forward. In front of me was an open field that briefly cleaved the forest in two. My ribs throbbing and my lungs burning, I ran. The wolf, no closer, no farther away, 
began to bellow unceasingly. As it did so, other sounds rose. There was the scattering of leaves, the snapping of branches, and a heavy thumping on the ground that began to flow towards me like an invisible river, something that could not be outrun. The first of the elk rushed past me on my left, a thousand pounds of imposing muscle in full stride, fleeing an unseen pursuer. I never even saw the second one of the group until its antlers struck my left hand as it passed me, breaking bone. I screamed and, utterly spent, I could only shamble along at jogging speed, gripping my agonized wrist, waiting to be struck a final time. One elk hooked sharply to the right to get out of my way before it would have crushed me, grunting wetly. It barely grazed my side, but its bulk was enough to make me stumble and collapse into the dead grass. Convinced by the noise of the hooves all around me that the stampede was going to kill me if I didn't keep moving, I rolled and uh, tried to make it back onto my feet. An elk went right over me then, leaping cleanly before I could fully rise. It landed awkwardly, its legs buckling, but then regained its speed. I'd become nothing more than a stumbling, comical rag doll when the one behind it grazed my right leg and I fell to the ground one more time. There was a yelping sound from the tree line I had emerged from. I finally looked back as the last of the elk galloped past me. One of them, too slow in escaping the woods, was collapsing in a dusty cloud fifty yards behind. The wolf thing was taking it down. Its ropey arms were wrapped around its neck, and it seemed to be burrowing its head into its prey. I remained on my knees, shivering with pain, watching the end of the attack, trying to regain whatever breath I could. As soon as the elk no longer presented a threat, incapacitated but still alive, the wolf let it go and looked towards me across the field. It rose and continued to chase its original target. Before I turned to run, I saw how it struggled so to achieve a fluid motion, as if unable to make sense of its own skeleton. It looked like a stop-motion monster in a crudely made B-movie. All it could really do effectively was snarl and grab and bite and it was clear that I could run as fast as it could if my lungs would support me. But I swear, I swear that its legs had somehow grown longer than when I first saw them. The elk had scattered in all directions across the field. Past it, another vast patch of trees began. Sharp stitches dug into my side to go with the throbbing in my left hand, which I held up before me as I ran into this new darkness. I could hear myself breathing like a sputtering boat engine about to give out. I blundered past great fallen timber struck down by wind or lightning, felt my forehead torn by a low-hanging branch I never saw coming, splashed through a puddle of cold standing water whose breadth I woefully misjudged, soaking my shoeless right foot. I had only half as much stamina as before my first fall. Yet when I chanced to look behind me, I sensed that I had put a considerable distance between myself and the wolf. And then, deliverance. The woods broke a final time into terrain that stunned me with its abrupt familiarity. I was on another road, but this one represented the outer edge of a quiet, rural neighborhood. It was barely a hundred-yard run to three small, working-class houses nestled in the trees, old, repair-starved things lining a lightless street that hadn't been repaved in a long time. The weight of many snows had turned it into a ragged derelict. An old man was walking from an ancient stretch Cadillac parked on stones toward his front door, holding a cheap plastic convenience store grocery bag. I ran towards him, holding my right hand high, trying to keep calm and not terrify him. I believe I botched my approach and first contact considerably, unable to stop myself when I finally did reach him from immediately emphasizing the size of the wolf that was pursuing me and even clumsily describing aspects of its troubling anatomy. The man was likely in his 80s, visibly frail. He responded just as I'd hoped with an urging to follow him into the house where we'd 
look out and see what we could see. My eyes didn't leave the murky tree line beyond the road as we moved with more slowness than I thought I could bear. Only when the old man got out his keys and put them into the lock did I feel I was somewhat out of danger. The closing of the door behind us brought such an oppressive blanket of warmth that I briefly saw spots in front of my eyes. His little living room was tidy and tastefully lit. Bookcases took up two whole walls, and original framed art seemed to fill up all the other available display space. He set his bag down in his tiny bachelor's kitchen and urged me to continue to talk, to tell him everything. I only skimmed my encounter with the stranger and spoke in a rush of being pinned down in my car by a creature that was unlike anything I'd ever seen. He was horrified by my escape across the field and the injury to my hand. I was lucky to find this man. He continued to respond kindly and helpfully and courteously, offering me a wet rag to dab away the blood on my forehead. As I called the police on his cell phone, he looked out the kitchen window, watching the night attentively, distracted only for a moment when he got me a bottle of water out of his refrigerator. After I delivered another wild monologue into the phone, helpless to curb my trauma, the police dispatcher asked if I needed an ambulance. Looking down at my left hand, I judged overconfidently that the swelling and the worst of the pain had stopped, and it could wait until I went to the hospital under my own power. I wanted more than anything to get back to my car somehow. The old man urged me to sit in his most comfortable chair in the living room until the police arrived, and to take off my soaked sock. I waved away an offer to wrap my hand in a towel. I thanked him profusely, starting to become ashamed I had broken down so, was so utterly like an eight-year-old spilling out a story well shy of coherence. He had read a lot of things in his time, he told me, and he had learned there were truly strange things in the world. He did like to read. He asked me to describe the wolf in ever more detail, clearly fascinated, and I tried my best. We both got up to venture out onto the front step, me hanging back cautiously in the doorway. I wouldn't let the man go more than three long paces outside. He would have been utterly unable to defend himself. Still, there was no sign of the beast out there in the dark. The only sound was the wind sifting gently through the trees and blowing dead leaves across the road. He told me he saw elk walking through the neighborhood all the time, one stuck its snout right in his mailbox to get it some cookies once. We went back inside, to our chairs, safe and warm behind the latching of the door. The man leaned forward to poke at the glowing cinders in his fireplace, and I found myself entranced by them. The hint of glowing warmth from the hearth felt so good on my bare right foot. Did you notice that moon tonight? he asked me. A doozy. I said that I had only been grateful it was so bright tonight. Otherwise, I might have become deeply confused in the woods and in the field and never made it out. He fiddled with the iron poker, looking contemplatively past me out the living room window. Funny how the full moon became a scary thing because of the movies, he said, and I agreed. But he thought there was more to it. We like to think of the moon when it's simple and bright and lovely, he reflected. It's a pleasant, artistic abstraction. But the fact is, when it's full like that, you start to see all those rough contours, and it looks a little like a skull. You feel the cold, bleak reality of a desolate mass in space. That's why I think the full moon became a little frightening. I don't know if I see it that way, I said. It had been almost 15 minutes since my phone call to the police. I wondered aloud what was taking so long. The old man said gently that he wasn't sure what I'd told them had come out in a way they'd respond to quickly. He added it wasn't my fault. 
I was still likely in shock and not quite able to communicate how I normally would. I'd maybe used a few extreme adjectives that might give them pause. They may have thought they were dealing with someone with a tall imagination, and would until they discovered my car and maybe tangible traces of the wolf. Not that the police weren't coming. He was sure they were. Just maybe not at top speed. He was right. It was starting to sink in that the jumble of words and images I'd given them over the phone was likely more chaotic, more sensational than I'd even first thought. But that's their job, I said to my host. To trust what we say, right? I don't know if they see it that way, he said with a sad smile. We kept talking by the hearth about the deep woods and creatures that eluded understanding. And at precisely 1.45, we heard the crash outside, way down the road. When we hurried out into the front yard, we saw sporadic, silent snaps of electric blue light against the tree line. There, unprepared people who hadn't listened properly to facts had met with a force totally indifferent to them. A once complex soul whose awful new existence held only considerations of hunger, pursuit, and violence. But my new friend and I, we, we were ready.